I wonder if you would take out that gospel message again. I'd like to take a look at that with you. And I'd like to read half of it. But look at John chapter 10, starting with verse 14. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. That is God's desire around the world today as he gathers his people in really remarkable ways. This group of people you see are recent graduates of the Mongolian Lutheran Bible School. Many of them came from a Buddhist background, some from a shamanist background, others from a communist background, but all of them have come to faith and now want to learn more about their Christian faith. A lot of them are college graduates or college students. There's an older lady you can kind of see up in the corner from a Buddhist background. But all these people have come to faith in this country that is remarkably becoming more and more Christian. In 1990, communism fell in Mongolia and they literally recorded four Christians in the whole country. I don't know who did the math, but it was pretty simple math. I can figure that out too. One, two, three, four. But today, 20 years later, the numbers go anywhere from 60 to 100,000. It's a church growing at an exponential rate. So as you look at those faces, I wish I could kind of do a close-up on the young man in the second row there to the far left. He's number two from the, from the end there in second row. His name is Idre. And if you zoomed in on Idre's face, you would see the lines and the marks of alcoholism. Idre's had a rather tough life and many people kind of gave him up as a hopeless drunk. But six years ago, Idre gave up drinking through the power of God and now sober for six years. He's a remarkable witness to people who see in his face every time he talks about his faith in Jesus. They see how Jesus has changed his life completely. And Idre now is working with a group of alcoholics in central Mongolia. We bought a little house for $5,000, restored it, and they live there, and they work there, and Idre works with them. And they know that he's somebody who knows their troubles because he's been there, and he's lived through it, and he's there to tell them that there is hope. There is hope in Christ who comes to save all people and gather them into that sheep pen. As you travel through Mongolia, I wish I could kind of take you along in the little mini jeep I take. There's these triangular forms of rocks called ovos and in varying sizes and shapes, but you see them all around the country. And Mongolians believe that these are holy sites. They believe spirits live in those areas of the rocks. And so you'll see as they drive across the country, they'll get out of the car and sometimes they'll take a walk around three times, throwing money maybe leaving vodka or cigarettes. I didn't know spirits drank vodka. But they feel like they're giving something to a spirit that will protect them on their journey. Because Mongolians live in fear of the spirit world. And so they find, try to find some way to placate, some way to propitiate that God, that spirit, give it something so it will leave them alone. It will protect them, perhaps. But it's a constant barter system. And as you travel there, I'm always amazed at little stories I see. I was in the capital, Ulaanbaatar, capital city, mind you, center of the city. And try and picture this, a 15-story building, perfect shape, sitting there unused now since it was built 10 years ago. And I asked one of the Finnish missionaries, I said, what, what's wrong with it? Is it structurally unsound? Is there a problem with the building? He said, there's nothing wrong with the building. But the rumor was started 10 years ago that evil spirits inhabit the building. And so that building remains to this day right in the center of a capital city, vacant, because people fear the spirit world. Pastor Sina of the Lutheran Church in Ulaanbaatar told me that when one of his members dies, naturally he plans for a Christian funeral, but 
the relatives all come in from the countryside and most of them are Buddhist and they demand, demand a Buddhist funeral. And he tries calmly to explain that this person was a Christian and we're going to do a Christian burial and they say, no, you have to do a Buddhist funeral. And so they fear the consequences for themselves, not for the dear departed loved one. They fear that if they do not do a Buddhist ritual, they will be punished by the spirits. Fear of the spirit world. And so Sina tells me it's almost like a page out of the Old Testament with Elijah and the prophets of Baal. He says, we flip a coin and the Buddhist Lama will conduct a ritual and I will conduct a Christian burial service. And imagine the message that they hear because they've come so far, they stay for both services. And so if the Buddhist Lama starts off, he'll talk about life as a rotating wheel that goes round and round, and you're reincarnated again, and much depends upon your good works. If you live a bad life, you come back in a lower existence. If you live a good life, perhaps a slightly higher existence, but that wheel goes round and round, and it's hopeless. And then Sina tells them, that body you see here, that shell, will come to life again on the last day. Because this person believed in Christ who conquered death, that body will rise again. And that person we loved will live again and breathe and speak. That body. And you can imagine the two messages juxtaposed together. A message of hopelessness, of continual round and round, and another message that says there is hope. And you can see why the church grows in countries like Mongolia that now have the freedom to worship that they have not had 20 years ago. Oftentimes I'll, I'll send you a newsletter usually every month and I try to explain to you some things that are going on but there's one thing I can't speak about and I cannot speak about work in another area, the Islamic Republic of Iran. But I'm becoming more and more aware of the growing Christian movement within a country that most of us see on the news is right now caught in a battle of nuclear weapons. Are they developing them or not? When will they develop them? Will Israel or another country invade? These are the stories we see on the news. We see Muslims shaking their fist and saying death to America. But there's another story going on behind the scenes. And as our people go into the country, they tell me of a hunger, a hunger for people who are looking for hope and are not finding it in Islam. I have a cousin a little bit older than me and she and her husband were graduates of Michigan State Film School and they had a friend from Iran and in the mid 70s she told me she says we traveled across the country shooting a documentary film trying to show what life was like there. The Shah of Iran was ruling the king of Iran at that time but she says I noticed women beginning to start to dress in the traditional clothing of the hijab and covering themselves and I saw something developing. And four years after she left, Ayatollah Khomeini came in from France on a plane and declared an Islamic Republic. And so it has been for the last 30 years. People have lived under the strong influence of Islam. An interesting fact is that 70% of Iranians today are 26 or younger. They have known only an Islamic Republic. And when we talk to some of these people and those who have left the country and refugees I get to talk to, they tell me of a burdensome system that no one can keep. And many Iranians ironically become atheist. You may see them go into mosques on TV, but they said they don't believe because if you see a government that will take a 14 year old girl who's been raped and blame her for her rape, and then gather people in a central square and like a page out of a 19th century Wild West picnic hanging will hang her from a construction crane. And people see this. And one of our young men talks about this is what Islam has become for many Iranians and they hate it. They hate what they've become, they hate who they are. And they say there must be something else out there or there is nothing. And so the ironic thing is that through this harsh law that has been ruling in Iran, the gospel message is all that much sweeter. One of our contacts told us, he said, after he explained what life was like growing up in Iran, and he said, but you tell me of a God who loves, you tell me of a God who gives freely, you tell me of a God of grace. 
tell me more. And many are saying, tell me more. An interesting phenomenon in the Middle East and in Iran, in many countries there are Muslims are having dreams. They're having dreams of Jesus. It's more than just a coincidence. I'm, I'm running into too many people. One of our contacts, also in Iran, has talked about this vision of Jesus. It's kind of like the song we sang, I have heard you calling in the night. Many are hearing Christ calling to them in their dreams. And they talk of a Jesus who comes to them with a nail prints in his hand. And in Islam, they were told that Jesus didn't die on the cross. They were told that Jesus is just a great prophet. Who is this person coming to us in our dreams? He shines bright as the sun. He's got marks that come from a cross that Muslims say didn't happen. And they want to know more. Who is this Christ? Who is this Jesus? And they are seeking. And house churches are growing now at an alarming rate to the president of Iran because Mahmoud Ahmadinejad has said he will destroy the house church movement in Iran, which is growing like wildfire. Big surprise to us. We didn't know it was until he said that publicly six years ago. And we see things that are now beginning to happen because people are searching for hope and they're not finding it in Buddhism. They're not finding it in Islam. And Christ is calling to them. Christ is calling to them not only in their country, but as they become refugees in other lands. I had the chance three months ago to go to Germany where our partner church, the Independent Lutheran Church of Germany, is doing mission outreach to Iranian refugees. Now some of the people we gathered for a weekend, they were atheist, some were Muslim, some were Christian. And as we talked to them, I had a real strong urge to share with them Revelation 7-9, the vision of John of this large number of people of every race, tribe, and tongue around the throne of the Lamb, praising and worshiping the Lamb. And since they didn't understand German, I spoke in English and they translated into the Farsi language of the Iranian people. But my translator stumbled over the Lamb of God and he said, I can't say that. And I thought he just didn't quite understand the concept. So I explained it in German to another person and he explained Jesus Christ, Lamb of God. And we moved on. But afterwards I talked to a German missionary and he told me, he says, did you see what happened? Wasn't it wonderful? And I'm not the sharpest razor in the drawer. I kind of, you have to spell it out for me. What, what just happened? I thought the translator didn't understand. And he said he understood perfectly. He's a Muslim. He can't say Jesus is the Lamb of God. But he was struggling with it. And our missionary noticed, he worked with him, he says he's struggling because he's seeing something in Christianity that's touching his heart, and yet Islam tugs at him. And so remember people like him in your prayers because we are all called to be Christ's ambassadors. We read in the epistle lesson that we are Christ's ambassadors, that he works through us. Now, I don't know about you, but that's pretty intimidating for me, thinking God working through me. And you probably think the same way. I mean, I'm not eloquent. I can't say these things. I remember doing a sermon in Russian where I tried to explain that Jesus Christos stradal za nas. Jesus suffered for us. But I said it a little too, quick, too quickly and said, Jesus Christos rastrel za nas, which means Jesus Christ was shooting people for us. I feared that people in my congregation were getting this image of Jesus wearing a 10-gallon hat with a six-shooter firing away. So we are not perfect and we are imperfect in the way we present that message and yet he works through imperfect vessels like us. So that message of Christ calling to all these different people to come into the pen, it resonates not only halfway around the world but here too. Every time I come back to the States I realize that more and more people are no longer professing Christ. And we are called to that. We're not called to eloquence, but we are called to give a living witness to our faith in word and deed. And guess what? However imperfect it is, the Spirit is powerful enough to work through us. So may He work, and will that work, in your lives and in all of ours, through the power of God. Amen. Let's thank God for a man, his work, his message.
for Sandy being here today. Again, these are the heroes of the church, the ones who literally put their lives on the line sometimes to bring Jesus to other places.